Good afternoon and welcome. I'm Trent Lobster with the School District of Palm Beach County Department of Educational Technology, and I am so thrilled to be with you today as uh, we host an afternoon reading from poet Brian Turner. Our visiting poet and author is here this afternoon thanks to our partners at the Palm Beach Poetry Festival in celebration of National Poetry Month. Founded in 2005, the, poetry, the Palm Beach Poetry Festival is a nonprofit organization dedicated to fostering the writing, reading, performance, and appreciation of poetry by presenting an annual festival and other poetry events right here in Palm Beach County, featuring America's finest poets. Their annual high school poetry competition takes place every December, so students mark your calendars, and their poetry performance outreach project started by Dr. Blaze Allen has brought many world-renowned poets into our high schools over the last 16 years to inspire our students. More information about the Palm Beach Poetry Festival can be found on their website at palmbeachpoetryfestival.org. Now, uh, speaking of world-renowned poets, uh, let's get to today's honored speaker, Brian Turner. Uh, Brian is a poet and memoirist who served seven years in the U.S. Army. He's the author of two poetry collections, Phantom Noise and Hear Bullet, which won the 2005 Beatrice Hawley Award, the New York Times Editor's Choice Selection, the 2006 Penn Center USA Best in the West Award, the 2007 Poets Prize, and others. In addition to his poetry, he is the editor of the anthology The Kiss, a diverse anthology of essays, stories, poems, and graphic memoirs. Turner's work has been published in National Geographic, The New York Times, Poetry Daily, Harper's Magazine, and other fine journals. Turner has been awarded a United States Arts Fellowship, an NEA Fellowship, a Lannan Foundation Fellowship, and more. His recent memoir, My Life as a Foreign Country, has been called achingly, disturbingly, shockingly beautiful. Mr. Turner, welcome. Thanks so much for having me today. I'm excited to, to meet everyone and to, uh, to share some poems. Uh, I, I appreciate it. Um, I'm grateful uh, to, to all who have made this possible today. Uh, I'm thinking of the Palm Beach Poetry Festival itself. Um, you know, thank you, Mr. Lapsher, and um, to Miles Kuhn as well, and Dr. Allen, um, Susan Williamson, and Jennifer Litt, and, and all of the faculty and, and uh, folks, support folks who've made all of this happen. Um, I think I should just dive into some poems, you know? Um, that's what we're here for, right? I was, um, I was a soldier in the U.S. Army uh, from 2000 three to 2004 in Iraq. I was actually in the army for seven years total, but uh, I, how do you talk about that? How do you, how do you write poems about that? What I'm talking about is being in combat zone or a place of great difficulty. Usually we talk about writing um, about difficult events from a, a room, place of remove. So after time has passed by and we've been able to sort of process an event, um, some poets will say it's poetry is best written in tranquility. Once we're in a space where we can sort of breathe and be and be able to think about the thing. But I think it's also important, and in my own life it has proven to be so, the, uh, to be able to respond in the moment. And so I'll, I'll begin with reading a few poems that were from my first book, Here Bullet, which I wrote in my notebooks when I was in Iraq. And I'll start with this poem. It's called Alhazen of Basra. If I could travel a thousand years back to August 1004, to a small tent where Alhazen has fallen asleep among books about sunsets, shadows, and light itself, I wouldn't ask where light, whether light travels in a straight line or what governs the laws of refraction or how he discovered the bridgework of analytical geometry. I would ask about the light within us. What shines in the mind's great repository of dream and whether he studied the deep shadows daylight brings, how light defines us. 
And that's a question that's stuck with me over the years. How will we be defined? What will we do with our hands and our energy and our time? The one great gift we have, time. How will we study the deep shadows that daylight brings? How will we be defined by the light that we live in? Um, when I, I crossed the border with my unit, uh, I was an army soldier and we went from Kuwait into Iraq on the 3rd of December, 2003. This poem starts with a quote from Al-Jawahiri, which is, I see a horizon lit with blood and many a starless night. A generation comes and another goes and the fire keeps burning. Highway one. It begins with the highway of death with an untold number of ghosts wandering the road at night, searching for the way home to Najaf, Kirkuk, Mosul, and Kani al-Sad. It begins here with a shuffling of feet on the long road north. This is the spice road of old, the caravan trail of camel dust and heat, where Egyptian limes and sultani lemons swayed in crates strapped down by leather, where merchants traded privet flowers and musk, aloes, honeycombs, and silk brought from the Orient, past marsh Arabs and the Euphrates wheel, past wild camels and waving children who marvel at the painted guns, the convoy pushes on, past the ruins of Babylon and Sumer, through the land of Gilgamesh, where the minarets sound the Muzian's prayer, resonant and deep. Cranes roost atop power lines and enormous bowl-shaped nests of sticks and twigs, and when a sergeant shoots one from the highway, it pauses as if amazed that death has found it here at 7 a.m. on such a beautiful morning before pitching over to the side and falling in a slow unraveling of feathers and wings. Which um, sometimes in the world you don't have to make things up. It seems that crane being shot from, from its roost from the, from the highway, it seems like a poetic device or something you might make up in fiction to be sort of metaphorical of beauty being lost in a tragic time. But um, sadly, you don't have to make up the things uh, sometimes in this world. Um, but what can we do to make things like that happen less often? This poem is called AB Negative, the surgeon's poem. Thalia Fields lies under a gray ceiling of clouds, just under the turbulence, with anesthetics dripping from an IV into her arm. And the flight surgeon says, the shrapnel cauterizes it traveled through her here, breaking this rib as it entered, burning a hole through the left lung to finish in her back. And all of this she doesn't hear, except perhaps as music, that faraway music of people's voices when they speak gently and with care, a comfort tour on a stretcher in a flying hospital en route to Launchstuhl, just under the rain at midnight. And Thalia drifts in and out of consciousness as a nurse dabs her lips with a moist towel, her palm on Thalia's forehead, her vitals slipping some as burned flesh gives way to the heat of blood, the tunnels within opening to fill her, just enough blood to cough up and drown in. Thalia sees shadows of people working to save her, but cannot feel her hands, cannot hear them any longer. And when she closes her eyes, the most beautiful colors rise in darkness, tangerine washing into Russian blue with the droning engine humming on and a dragonfly's wings, island palms painting the sky in impossible hue with their thick brushes dripping green, which is a way of dealing with the fact that Thalia Fields is gone long gone, about as far from Mississippi as she can get, 10,000 feet above Iraq with a blanket draped over her body and an exhausted surgeon in tears, his bloodied hands on her chest, his head sunk down, the nurse guiding him to a nearby seat and holding him as he cries, though no one hears it because nothing can be heard where pilots fly in blackout, the plane like a shadow guiding the rain here in the droning engines of midnight. Um, you know, I, I wrote that poem uh, again when I was in Iraq in my notebooks, and it was about a, there was a cook who was in our unit. She was attached to us from another battalion, um, an army soldier like myself. Uh, she was a cook, um, but she also her secondary job was as a 50 caliber machine gunner. 
So sometimes they would take food in these large trucks out to smaller bases like where I was at. And while she was on one of these missions, a roadside bomb went off and, and the rest. Um, I didn't know her well or personally. I would see her sometimes when we'd go into, we call them chow halls, these large, um, like, um, you know, dining facilities or dining halls. And uh, there was one in Mosul in the northern part of Iraq. It's a very big city. And when we would go in there, there were hundreds of us walking by and she had to count us in. And I remember she used to wear these contacts that had like this iridescent quality. So her brown eyes were then sort of sort of greenish and, and just amazing. She had startling eyes, you know, and, and I know she didn't notice me at all. I was just another person who walked by that she had to count, but, but she was unforgettable, you know? Um, that's not her real name. I say Thalia Fields. I, I didn't feel comfortable enough to say her name in, in particular because I felt she should still have her life, her private privacy. Um, so I made up, the, I used a name from a babysitter when I was a kid. Her name was Thalia and I've never seen that in a poem before. And then Fields is a gesture to Whitman, this idea of many of these, the leaves of grass, Thalia Fields. Like there are many uh, losses that are, difficult um, on all sides of, of the battlefield and, and the, the country, I should say, even more. This next poem is called Eulogy. It happens on a Monday at 11.20 a.m. as tower guards eat sandwiches and seagulls drift by on the Tigris River. Prisoners tilt their heads to the west, though burlap sacks and duct tape blind them. The sound reverberates down concertina coils the way piano wire thrums when given slack. And it happens like this on a blue day of sun when Private Miller pulls the trigger to take brass and fire into his mouth. The sound lifts the birds up off the water. A mongoose pauses under the orange trees and nothing can stop it now. No matter what blur of motion surrounds him, no matter what voices crackle over the radio in static confusion, because if only for this moment the earth is stilled and Private Miller has found what low hush there is down in the eucalyptus shade there by the river. Hmm. Um, Private Miller was... Uh, I remember he used to wear these really thick glasses that were um, distributed by the army for, for soldiers. He didn't wear his own personal glasses. He would get the ones that were issued by the army. They were so thick. And I, you know, I remember joking around with him one time and I, I said, Hey Miller, when are we going home? And he was like, what? And I was like, I know you could see the future with those glasses. When are we going home, man? <laughs> and I remember him laughing. And, um, and I just think of all these years that he didn't get to come home. Um, and I and I wish he was here with us. So, for Private Miller, this poem is called Katusha Rockets," which are a type of. They're very. I, I heard them go over uh, this base that I was in. They were firing at our base, but they're notoriously inaccurate. And thankfully, they were at this time too. So they flew right over, and then they exploded out in the desert right past us. Um, so this poem does an imaginative thing. You'll see that it takes the rockets that are being fired and has them come all the way home to America. Katusha Rockets. The 107s have a crackling sound of fire and electricity, of air-ruckled heat, and when they pinwheel of the rooftops of Amman al Alil, they just keep going, traveling for years over the horizon to land in the meridians of Divisadero Street, where I'm standing early one morning on a Memorial Day in Fresno, California, which is where I'm from. The veterans prayed, scattering at the impact, mothers shielding their children by instinct, old war vets crouching behind automobiles as police set up an outer cordon for the unexploded ordnance. Rockets often fall in the night sky of the skull, down long avenues of the brain's myelin sheathing over synapses and the rough structures of thought, they fall into the hippocampus, into the seat of memory, where lovers and strangers and old friends entertain themselves, unaware of the dangers headed their way, or that I will need to search among them the way the bomb disposal tech walks tethered and alone down to Visadero Street, suited up as if walking on the moon's surface, as the crowd watches just how determined he is 
to dismantle death, to take it apart piece by piece, the bravest thing I've ever seen. Which to that point, it may have been the bravest thing I've ever seen. I wrote that poem in 2004, thinking about this bomb disposal tech that I'd watched walk down an avenue in Mosul to go dis dismantle a bomb. But, um, and I'll talk about this a little bit um, later, but my, my wife had cancer and for several years she battled against cancer. And um, during that period, I saw things that I, I think in some ways were, I think I learned something more about bravery. Um, I learned quite a bit more through her. Will, again, we'll get to that in a moment. Um, here's, this will be, if you've never heard this poem, it may be a bit strange. The language is very um, compressed and lyrical and charged. So let's see what you think. But this poem I'm about to read, I wrote it very quickly when I was in Iraq. I folded it up, I put it in a Ziploc bag, and I carried it in my chest pocket the rest of the time that I was in, in, a, combat, in a combat zone in, in Iraq itself. Hear a bullet. If a body is what you want, then here is bone and gristle and flesh. Here is the clavicle snapped wish, the aorta's open valves, the leap thought makes at the synaptic gap. Here is the adrenaline rush you crave, that inexorable flight, that insane puncture into heat and blood. And I dare you to finish what you've started because here, bullet, here is where I complete the word you bring hissing through the air. Here is where I moan the barrel's cold esophagus, triggering my tongue's explosives for the rifling I have inside of me. Each twist of the round spun deeper because here, bullet, here is where the world ends every time. So I don't know how it is for you, but that's, um, it's a pretty, it's a, it's a, it's strange to me. I'm still trying to figure that out and trying to learn from that poem. Um, actually all the poems that I've read today, I'm still learning things from them. That's, that's why I still read them. But this one in particular, um, uh, pulls me back to it. I, I think it's in part that recognition in that last line here is where the world ends every time. And I'm thinking about dying there, you know, and I'm thinking about with each person when they go, when they cross over, as some people say, in a sense, the whole universe goes with them in that moment. Um, so there's a, a great loss when someone's taken before their time, you know. Here's the last poem that I wrote when I was in Iraq. Uh, I was in a, on an air base. We were, my platoon, about 48 of us were waiting to get on a plane that would fly us out of this air base. But um, uh, the poem is written as if I'm already on the plane looking back from where I've come. It's called Night in Blue. At 7,000 feet and looking back, running lights blacked out under the wings an America waiting a year of my life disappears at midnight, the sky a deep viridian, the house lights below small as match heads burned down to embers. Has this year made me a better lover? Will I understand something of hardship, of loss? Will a lover sense this in my kiss or touch? What do I know of redemption or sacrifice? What will I have to say of the dead? That it was worth it? That any of it made sense? I have no words to speak of war. I never dug the graves in Talafar. I never held a mother crying in Ramadi. I never lifted my friend's body when they carried him home. I have only the shadows under the leaves to take with me. The quiet of the desert, the low fog of Balad, orange groves with ice forming on the rinds of fruit. I have a woman crying in my ear late at night when the stars go dim. Moonlight and sand is a resonance of the dust of bones and nothing more. Hmm. I wonder, you know, we, we sometimes, soldiers will be called back from overseas and they come home. What is it they're thinking? What are they writing in their notebooks? Here's one, this is me. This is what I was writing in my notebook as I was thinking about coming home. Um, it seems to me that most things in life are very messy and complicated and layered and human and are not easily reducible to simple um, 
simple things like this is good or this is bad or we should do this or we should do that. It just seems like life is usually far more complicated than, than it's sometimes portrayed. Um, I'm just going to take a quick uh, drink. Once I came home, I was in Fresno, where, I, where I'm from, in California. And I had a simple thing. I needed to go get some nails from a hardware store at home, Lowe's Home Improvement Center. And that's the title of this poem, At Lowe's Home Improvement Center. Here's what happened. Standing in aisle 16, the hammer and anchor aisle, I bust a 50-pound box of double-headed nails open by accident. Their oily bright shanks and diamond points like firing pins from M4s and M16s. In a steady stream, they pour onto the tile floor, constant as shells falling south of Baghdad last night, where Bosch kneeled into the chain guns of helicopters stationed above their tracer fire, a synaptic geometry of light. At dawn, when the shelling stops, hundreds of bandages will not be enough. Bosch walks down aisle 16 now in full combat gear, improbable, worn out from fatigue, a rifle slung at his side, his left hand guiding a 10-year-old boy who has seen what war is and will never rid it from his head. Here, Bosch says, take care of him. I'm going back in for more. Sheets of plywood drop with the airy breath of mortars the moment they crack open in shrapnel. Mower blades are just mower blades, and the Troy-built self-propelled mower doesn't resemble a Blackhawk or an Apache. In fact, no one seems to notice the Casualty Collection Center, Doc High, marks out in ceiling fans, aisle 15, where wounded Iraqis with IVs sit propped against boxes as 92 sample Paradiso fans hover in a slow revolution of blades. The forklift driver over-adjusts, swinging the tines until they slice open gallons and gallons of paint, sienna dust and lemon sorbet and ship's harbor blue, pooling in the aisle where Sergeant Rampley walks through, carrying someone's blown-off arm, cradled like an infant, handing it to me, saying, hold this, Turner. We might find who it belongs to. Cash registers open and slide shut with the sound of machine guns being charged. Dead soldiers are laid out of the registers on the black conveyor belts, and people in line still reach for their wallets. Should I stand at the magazine rack reading Landscaping with Stone or the Complete Home Improvement Repair Book? What difference does it make if I choose tumbled tavertine tile, baracino marble, or black absolute granite? Outside, palm trees line the asphalt boulevards. Restaurants cool their patrons who will enjoy fireworks exploding over Bass Lake in July. But inside, aisle number seven is a corridor of lights. Each dead Iraqi walks amazed by Tiffany posts and Bavarian pole lights. Motion-activated incandescents switch on as they pass by, reverent sentinels of light welcoming them to Lowe's Home Improvement Center, aisle number seven, where I stand in mute shock, someone's arm cradled in my own, the Iraqi boy beside me reaching down to slide his fingertip in retro-colonial blue at interior latex before writing T for tourniquet on my forehead. I sometimes ask people um, at readings, could we as a country be bleeding but not even know it? I think that can be asked in many different contexts. Um, we've been at war as long as all of you in these different high schools that are here today, for as long as you've been alive. You've never done something like this that wasn't at a time of war for this country. But I look outside, and it doesn't look like there's any war at all. I don't have to think about it. To me, that seems like a problem. What I mean is, if a country is going to wage war, shouldn't it pay attention to it? It seems like a pathology or an illness not to. So, food for I, poets like myself, we have, I, I am under the, the belief that poets, their job isn't to um, sort of provide the answers. Um, to, to paraphrase William Stafford, another poet, um, the, the role of the poet is to ask the questions more clearly. 
Here's a poem called The Whale. It is 1970 and the summer of love is over. I am three years old, barefoot, running along the surf near Florence, Oregon, where an eight-ton sperm whale beached itself and died, the carcass rotting now, an entrance carved into its massive flank for cases of dynamite, 500 pounds of explosives necessary to rend open the interior so scavengers can pick the skeleton clean. But for me, it is a doorway to another world, the body of the sacred I might enter into, its eyes drained of all but a giant benevolence, flukes wide as the tail fins of bombers overhead. My mother hoisting me to her hip as engineers argue blasting caps and standoff distance, equations to undo the intricate puzzle of muscle and bone, the way life waits for us all with great patience, the electrons orbiting in their shells like distant planets we never see, the constellations which bind the universe undone this day, at least for this one body beached on the sand as we witness the blast from the sawgrass dunes, a sudden jolt of nerves as the body absorbs the shock wave, beach sand shot upward in jets of tissue and meat, the local news reporter dropping to his knees to cover his head with a clipboard, or the cameraman does the same, my mother shielding me with her torso turned away from the blast, and I remember everyone smiling afterward, laughing, each of us amazed the day a god was blown to pieces on the beach, and we all walked away from it, unscathed. Here's a poem. Um, in 2008, I was writing my second book, uh, part of that year and other years, but in that year, the Olympics were on, and I remember watching the Iraqi Olympic Committee um, argue a bit with the International Olympic Committee and some of the bureaucratic problems that happened with that meant that the, the Iraqi team, which had been larger, fewer of those athletes were able to go to the Olympics. This poem is about one of them, and his, it's uh, called Mohammed Trains for the Beijing Olympics 2008. And so um, because he had a certain weight class that he worked in, the, the, um, the lines are 10 to 12 syllable lines, so I, I try to have a kind of weight class for, my, for the verse. In the 69 kilogram weight class, the Bulgarian Bowevsky is a world record holder. He cannot be beaten, at least not by Sawara Muhammad. Muhammad at 26 has shoveled cement longer than he cares to remember. In Arbil, in Kurdish northern Iraq, he strains hard to lift the barbell with its heavy plates, round as the wheels of chariots. Then muscles give and the wheels bounce in dust before him. No, he cannot defeat the Bulgarian. The problem is in lifting weight over distance. It isn't a matter of iron or of will. And Beijing, Boevsky's records will go unnoticed because Muhammad is training now to lift the city of Arbil with its people. His quadriceps and posterior chain straining, the muscles tremoring to lift the Euphrates and Tigris, both mountains of the north, deserts of the west, Basra, Karbala, Ramadi, Tikrit, Mosul, three decades of war and the constant suffering of millions. This is what Sawara lifts. And no matter what effort he makes, he will fail completely and the people will love him for it. Don't you? Don't you love the fact that there are millions of people in places like Iraq and Afghanistan and Iran, China, that sometimes our, our nations seem to be in conflict you know, with each other. And at the same time, inside those nations are our brothers and sisters in this time. We all breathe in the oxygen of our time. We are alive in this time together. Um, how can we cheer each other on? So I, I'm going to read a poem called The Mutsunabe Street Bombing. In the moment after the explosion, an old man staggers in the cloud of dust and debris, hands pressed hard against bleeding ears, as if to block out the noise of the world at 11.40 a.m., 
the broken sounds of the wounded rising around them, roughened by pain. Buildings catch fire, cafes, stationary shops, the Renaissance bookstore, a huge column of smoke, a black anvil head pluming upward, fueled by the Kita Alakhani, Al Isfahani's book of songs, the elegies of Khansa, the exile poetry of Yusef and Al Azawi, religious tracts, manifestos, translations of Homer, Shakespeare, Whitman, and Neruda. These book leaves curl in the fire's blue tipped heat, and the long centuries handed down from one person to another, verse by verse, rise over Baghdad. As the weeks pass, sunsets deepen in color over the Pacific. Couples lie in the spring fields of California, drinking wine, making love in the lavender dusk. There is a sweet, apple-roasted smell of tobacco where they sleep. They dream, then wake to the dawn's early field of lupin, to discover themselves dusted in ash, the poems of Sulma and Sayab in their hair, Sadi on their eyebrows, Hafiz and Rumi on their lips. So that's one way to encourage you to, to go out and check out these poets that, that come up in that poem. Sayab, there's a, you know, check out a poem called Rain Song. There's a deep history with that. Um, Sadi, who wrote the Gulistan. Um, so I encourage you to, to, to read be, Beyond Borders if you aren't already. So here is a, a letter that uh, a poet in Baghdad asked me to write. His name is Sadek Mohammed for a, an anthology he's putting out. It's the, the essay. He asked us to write letters to um, to the pandemic. So I wrote one called Dear Silence, Dear Grief, Dear 2020. The yellow rain trees sway to the currents of wind blowing in from the Gulf this morning. The hurricane that swept through the Yucatan last week before rolling over Cuba has stalled out in open water. It churns in that deep blue space focused on some thought it has yet to seem to let go. The outer rain bands will spiral overhead throughout the day. For now, I stand under the canopy of rain trees and drink coffee as my dog rolls in the grass at my feet. I'm trying to imagine what I might say to the dead, to the dead I love, with this gift of a day I am given. I'd like to say something I've learned about the word love how it might illuminate the interior of my own life, how it adds to the horizon layers of history I carry within this aging body. But there are sirens dopplering through the streets, paramedics making their way to another tragedy. The world seems to be at fast at work disassembling itself. I would rather write a letter to the flower, to the atoms and molecular bonds and subatomic particles that hold the flower together, than write another eulogy of a letter to the grief you bring. 2020. When the sirens pass, a hush of sadness and wonder feathers down through the branches and sinks into the blades of grass, which lean over in a green curl of question marks. What can I say to the dead? What can I say to the living world? The sick and dying are displayed as terrain, as a kind of weather, with all of it mapped on the daily news in hues of tan and peach and magenta, Newscasters stand beside the map as numbers and charts detail the trauma state by state, while the larger world is rounded up into a shared number of pain. I sometimes watch the broadcasts without sound. There is something tender in how the reporters keep reaching out to those in pain, the way they gesture to the map with their palms laid out, so soft and empty, as if gathering in the dead, or waiting for a state like Mississippi or New York to break free and slide into their waiting palms as if some might be saved from the deepening magenta sky, that pandemic landscape clouding over them as its case numbers rise. And what can I possibly say to the hospitals or to the morgues, the doctors and nurses as they reinvent what it means to be a hero? Police officers and firefighters stand on the sidewalks to cheer them on. There is the banging of pots and pans throughout the cities of the world. Everyone seems to know when to cheer except me. Even the birds, they sing of the branches when the wind eases back. They know when the hurricane will make landfall in a few days. Even they know there is precious little time left to prepare. And I've been thinking about this, as I'm sure you have been too, this time of dying, the waves of people vanishing, 
the lonely dying in quiet rooms, the machines of no use to them there, the heroes crying in their masks and gowns, the bushes and trees outside leafing out in green applause as they are the only ones to see the dead off as they go. And I know it too, all year long I've known it 2020. I've known the gurney could wheel its way to me. I've known the trees might unfurl in a wild canopy of sunlight and shadow to wave me goodbye. The virus seated within me through the soft breath shared from one person to another. The way we say hello to strangers on the street the way we say thank you, the way we say goodbye, and the very breath makes it so. I'd be lying if I didn't admit it, that this pressure has pushed me to say what I need to say, not in another year, but in this one. The seasons have wheeled their way under the sun and stars, winter, spring, summer, fall. And throughout this year, I've leaned into the page, word by word, sentence by paragraph by page, it's a conversation I've held in my body for years now, words of love and sorrow and delight and loss, the words I give to my love, a book I've made so that we might have a place to live there in the imagination where anyone might wander in to witness how we kiss each other, how the word love hums in the air around us. This is what I've been doing quietly in my little home all year 2020. And so if I am to be gathered into the soft palms of the newscaster on the daily news and spoken of in hushed tones as the sirens sing through the streets of the world, you can find me in the backyard. I'm where the rain trees sway in the wind. I'm watching the storm as it comes in off the coast. I'm listening to the thunder of it. The many questions of the grass will be for others to answer. I'll be here drinking coffee, scratching my dog's belly as she rolls in the sweet green of a day on earth. Thank you all. Um, there's, there's one other poem that I hope you'll read in the packet. If you have the packet, um, I'm going to um, let my wife, who I just mentioned in that letter, uh, have the last word in a sense. Um, and I hope you'll enjoy this. There's a, I created a band after, after she passed on um, called the Interplanetary Acoustic Team. And I've, um, we, we put out an album a couple years back and what we did is all the words on the album, on the song that you're about to hear, they're all her words. Uh, she loved robots and cybernetics and the idea of uploading human consciousness into a cybernetic landscape. And so this, that's a larger story within the album. But in this song, um, there's, there's one thing that will help you is that there's a thing called binary code, right? Where the computers use and, uh, with ones and zeros. So what I did is I asked people who loved her, uh, many of her, her brothers and her close friends, many of them from different parts of the world, to all record them saying ones and zeros. So in the background, if you listen closely, you'll hear all of them creating a kind of rhythmic counterpoint of ones and zeros as her voice narrates the song. Um, I think I'm, I'm playing bass in some parts and doing some other stuff, some uh, electronic music, along with other various musicians who are just amazing and wonderful to help me with this project. Um, I wish you well. I hope you're having your, if you're a writer, um, that you'll put your words to the page. We need them and we will need them in the future too. And um, I wish you well in all that you might do. So for now, here's a song called Light Sketch. Thank you all. And so it goes, and so it goes. He raped, so dad, Mourinho, door. Words for losing places. Time is a rope, the long light of late afternoon. Sometimes when I wake, I'm shaping the world with my hands. Sometimes when I sleep, the world shapes me. Once I was energy, hiding inside the light with a shadow of light. 
love rooted us together exponentially. After we spoke in tongues, our fingers cupped the universe like water. Stripped bare, I offer myself to you, light of my days, saying, Beloved, let us inhabit this house of bone, all our earthly years, our flesh a taste of paradise. Oh, I got a little uh, nudge that I was muted um, as I was uh, as I was saying, even though nobody could hear me. Um, wow. Uh, and and thank you so much to uh, uh, Mr. Brian Turner for uh, for sharing all of the poems, the stories, the the, the thought processes of, of what um, uh, what it was like to live those things and then translate those into um, those uh, amazing poems. Um, I'm just absolutely uh, uh, just um, blown away, speechless. Um, and I, I really can't wait to hear all the feedback from our teachers and students um, that are watching from uh, the class today, possibly watching from home. Um, you know, uh, just a reminder that if you happen to uh, to join late or if, um, you know, you weren't able to catch the entire performance, a recording of the stream is going to be available um, directly after it ends on, on uh, the EdTech YouTube channel. So um, not to worry if you need to uh, uh, to go back and rewatch. I'm going to go back and rewatch. Um, and uh, it, it's just, it, it's been a fantastic afternoon. Um, before we go, uh, just a quick announcement for teachers. Don't forget that our annual technology conference um, is upcoming on October 15th. So uh, save the date and visit edtechtraining.palmbeachschools.org if you'd like more uh, uh, information on that. Um, on behalf of uh, all of us here at the School District of Palm Beach County, uh, Ed Tech team and our friends at the Palm Beach Poetry Festival. Thank you viewers for being here today and a very, very special and sincere thank you once again to Mr. Brian Turner um, for, uh, for stopping by and share the afternoon with us. Um, it's, it's been amazing. Um, take care everyone.